I'm Joe Doe, a metals and mining reporter for Bloomberg News. With me today, I have Barbara Humpton. She's the president and CEO of Siemens USA. Barbara, thanks so much for being with us. Joe, it's great to be with you. So let's just get right to it. There's a $1 trillion infrastructure package being passed around uh, Congress right now. Uh, they have some many objectives, including improving American competitiveness, and that's going to either be through investment uh, in infrastructure, uh, as well as a bill that uh, might have some implications on U.S.-China relations. I guess my first question is, does this legislation, if actually passed, will it actually improve American competitiveness or have any effect whatsoever on it? Well, yeah, and let me begin by just sharing with the audience two words about Siemens so that everyone understands why we view infrastructure investment as so critical. We are a technology company, and we've been in the backbone of the American economy for over 160 years. And we're focused on the kinds of technologies that bah, transform the everyday for everyone. You, things like bringing digital tools into manufacturing, things about making buildings more sustainable, making transportation more efficient. So, so these are areas that are obviously in the thick of infrastructure, and we've had a loud voice when it comes to this investment in infrastructure. Some things I'll share with you about whether, in fact, this will make a difference. The answer is a resounding yes. We already know that a dollar spent in infrastructure will yield an economic return of $4. And we have the ability now, by investing in in critical infrastructure like ports, airports, train systems, to make our transportation of goods and services uh, more efficient, more effective. And we have the ability now to look into some other areas like the manufacturing base to ensure America is ready for the future. Yeah, so I'm wondering, where are these dollars going? Yeah, the, the current plan is that the, especially in the bipartisan infrastructure framework. The plan is that we will be investing in what you think of as classic infrastructure. Think roads and bridges. Think about those things that we have used for the last century to help us be, uh, you know, form the foundation for our economy. And what I'm, what I'm proud to say is that the Congress has included some measures that would actually prepare us for the next century of American leadership, like digital upgrades to many parts of our infrastructure. And let me just give you one example, electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Think about it. We're entering a new phase when more and more consumers want to be driving electric vehicles, but the, the fleet can only grow as fast as the electric vehicle charging infrastructure grows. So provisions in the bill that would jumpstart investments in electric vehicle charging can make a huge difference in how we move forward. So I'm wondering, how is Siemens involved? And, and maybe the charging station is a good example. I think a lot of people might ask, well, Siemens and infrastructure, I'm not really sure how to make the connection here. Yeah, well, first of all, let me share with you how um, Siemens has been involved for uh, for many, many decades. And with a workforce of 40,000 people across the U.S., we're present in every state and most territories of the United States. And we're doing things like building infrastructure. You know that our cities today are becoming more interconnected. We want to be able to have systems that, uh, you know, help to drive information flow from building to electric grid to transportation systems. And Siemens is engaged in all of those efforts. So as an infrastructure company, we want to use our voice to think beyond concrete and steel and think now to the digitalization of everything and how this interconnectedness, this creation of smart infrastructure can actually transform our businesses. Hey, so Barbara, why don't we dig into that? I mean, digitalization and infrastructure, I mean, listen, I speak to steel companies all the time and steel workers, uh, they're not exactly getting down to the nitty gritty of talking about digital when it comes to infrastructure. They're just talking bridges and roads and, and like you said, commercial office buildings. So can you, can you make a connection there and explain to people really what that's talking about? 
for sure. Yeah, well, let's think about it first in how things are made. Yes, we are going to need steel, but we need steel production to be more sustainable. And we have new technologies coming into steel production that will actually reduce the carbon emissions from steel, et cetera. Digitalization is helping us do that, new tools that give us more control over the industrial processes. But there's more. Once we actually build that infrastructure by using sensor technologies, we're able to get better feedback about how the, how the infrastructure is working. When a train pulls into Penn Station in New York, there are some 600 data points on that locomotive that are feeding information back to operators. And so keeping our infrastructure performing on time and efficiently is actually enabled by digitalization. So like you're saying, in a lot of ways, uh, we'll have better information of maybe when trains are breaking down or when bridges need some sort of repairs. I, I guess that's really what you're getting at. Well, that's exactly right. And we've seen this in all kinds of businesses. Uh, you know, look back over this last decade, and you've seen how we've used technological innovations to create the internet of people. Now we're in a decade where we'll be having people connect the internet of what I call the internet of really big things. And, and it really is going to be transformative in each and every one of our markets. Moving uh, away from just the domestic market, I mean, how is it that public actions will affect private companies here ability to operate internationally? Well, we have to think holistically at this moment. And you know, over the last two years, we've had this incredible disruption brought on by COVID. But there were disruptions already underway. Uh, one of the things I'd really like us to focus on is the idea that there are better answers to how we can manufacture things. Now, think about this global supply chain. Glo globalization has been a theme for many decades now. And it seemed that industrial players were searching the globe for where is the lower, lowest cost labor pool that I can have access to so I can produce my goods. It's, it's been the, the law of mass production and low cost labor has been moving production capabilities from place to place around the world. What if the future is different? What if what makes the difference now is actually speed to need? You know how during COVID, we had this moment where we wondered, where are we going to produce ventilators? Well, that kind of question is being asked all over the place. Manufacturers everywhere are saying, how can I be more regional? And now we're talking about globalization, the idea that we actually can take advantage of global innovations, but implement our production many places around the world. It's not an or, it's not a reshoring, it's an and, where manufacturers are choosing to distribute their production capabilities on a more regional basis. Now, when we do that, there are a couple things that happen. You know, one, we are actually creating a more resilient supply chain. And, and then second, we're in many cases actually making those supply chains more sustainable with their impact on the planet as far less. I think in the future where we're headed is mass, mass customization rather than mass production. So, you know, if we think about this, there is a real transformation going on. Now, how are global um, governments handling this? We're in a moment where we really have to think carefully about creating a level playing field around the globe. And we can see those kinds of discussions happening. If we can create fair and open bases for trade, then we really can make well-informed decisions about where best to manufacture goods. Yeah, and can you maybe drill down a bit as to how this is different from, like you said, onshoring or reshoring? I mean, this is a huge topic within the Biden administration, and some days it feels like all they want to do is just bring all supply chains back to the United States. You seem to be saying maybe not that's not the answer, but uh, you know something that's a, a little more targeted. Yeah, I, I do think the Biden administration has wonderful goals and, and the goal of actually being capable of manufacturing the things that we need. It's a matter of national security now. And we've seen that. We've seen what happens when we are, you know, sort of at the, the mercy of supply chains where our goods are coming from a portion of the world that is literally shut down because of a pandemic. So knowing that we need to have the capability to make 
make things in the U.S. The Biden administration is taking steps that are helping to accelerate that. But it is a process, and, and they understand that as well. So we're in, a, we're in a moment, a transitional moment, where, yes, we are importing quite a bit from elsewhere, and I think we always will. But we're selecting really important elements in the supply chain where it's wise to make investments, bring the capability to make them in the U.S. And I think the thing everybody's working on is what are the right incentives and disincentives, carrots and sticks, to help people choose to make their investments in the things that we absolutely need right now. Hey, the CHIPS Act is a great example of this. We know we need to produce more semiconductors here in the United States. Look at all of the industries that are reliant on semiconductors, and our ability here in the U.S. has shrunk dramatically over the last couple of decades. Now, turn that around with some jumpstart investment, and what we'll see is the uh, a thriving supply chain. It will lift the boats of other industries that are dependent on that, a really wise investment. Yeah, it's, it seems like um, a lot of people would agree with you. I mean, I guess the tough part is figuring out how that, you know, how you get to the point of making that investment uh, and, and kind of targeting exactly what it is you're going to do, right? I mean, the chip shortage you give an example of is is kind of the, the anecdote of the past year and a half pandemic plus supply chain snags plus, you know, uh, developing infrastructure that seems to be at this nexus of what the Biden administration is going after. That's right. And they recognize it will take time. There's some really cool stuff going on, though, um, led by the administration. Now, think about it. What, what we realize here in the U.S., we've got the best system in the world, right? We, we recognize that innovation and growth is best driven by the public sector. And what we need from government is lightweight frameworks that will help set the stage for that kind of really open competition. And so when it comes to things like um, semiconductor shortages, one of the things the White House and Department of Commerce are facilitating is open data sharing amongst those who use semiconductors in the industry. Just like we do in cybersecurity, we see that it's in our common best best interest to communicate openly about the risks we're encountering and where we see opportunities. And then what that helps is it by, by helping the entire industry, we actually help elevate the game for everyone. Now, I would say over this last couple of years, the real heroes in industry have been our supply chain and logistics experts. And this is a moment when we really are letting them shine because so many of the decisions we need to make about where to invest and how how to devote our, our, our people, uh, where to place our people for, for max, maximum effectiveness, really is all about bottlenecks in the supply chain. You know, I want to go back to digital, and I want to focus again back on rebuilding America. And, you know, I think a lot of people want to know, how will digital manufacturing, uh, you know, help in rebuilding the country? Yeah, you know, over the last few years, I've often heard people worry about whether the robots are coming to take our jobs. And the fact is, nothing could be further from the truth. It's exactly the opposite. We are at a really fantastic moment. Siemens has been part of every industrial revolution, and we've seen a world where the industrial revolution shaped the way we live, lifted people out of poverty, you know, made communities thrive. And here we are on the cusp of this next revolution in which we bring the digital tools into manufacturing. And what does it do? Well, if we're able to automate repetitive, dangerous tasks, frankly, boring tasks, we are able to take those things off of the plates of people. By the way, many of those tasks are the very reason why we had offshoring in the past few years, because people were looking for the lowest cost labor to do those kinds of jobs. Now, what if those jobs actually can be done more effectively with automation in factories? We elevate the role of people in that whole equation. So what I'm excited about is the fact that digitalization is going to bring us the capability to build things differently, 
As I said earlier, the idea of taking advantage of innovation that's happening elsewhere and then taking digital plans, digital uh, uh, plots for processes and bringing them into more regional hubs for actual manufacturing, perhaps using additive manufacturing, 3D printing, you know, in order to make things in a new and different way. What we're going to find is that our manufacturing footprint can actually be lighter it can, we can uh, set it up closer to, um, you know, to hubs where people want to live and play. We can, because it'll be cleaner, more efficient. And, and then the role that people will be playing in that is much more taking advantage of what we bring as humans, creativity, excitement, entertainment, joy. So I know it's strange to be talking about joy in the field of manufacturing, but I, my prediction is that it will only be a few years from now when the main jobs we have in a, in a factory are going to look a lot more like playing a video game than in the past of dangerous, dark, and dirty. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, that, that's the obvious follow-up I think a lot of people want to ask is quite simply, what about the jobs? Um, yeah, I mean, you, you gave a little bit of a hint at it, which is video games. I've heard this before, especially in the mining sector, right? Uh, a lot of mining companies want to hire people actually with pretty good knowledge of video gaming. Uh, maybe you could go into that a little bit more. Yeah, and maybe a good way to tell the story is through the eyes of Corey Scales, uh, a manager in one of our plants. Um, he started at a time when you know people would come in and take a job, you know, entry level, and work their way up the chain. He himself has worked his way up to be a manager of in in one of our factories, and he tells the story of you know the fear when people started to see digital tools coming to the factory. Is this going to replace us? What he discovered is um, actually using digital tools allowed us to be more productive. Wow, by being more productive, we brought down the cost of our products. We could actually be more competitive as well. That brought on more volume. This has been a virtuous cycle that really has allowed him and his team to build their business. What kinds of things are they doing? They're, they're programming equipment that's actually taking some of the repetitive tasks in that factory and doing them more uh, it repeatably with quality, and, with, and without the safety issues we've been dealing with. And, and so through the eyes of someone like Corey, you see this evolution. You see the, you see the, the, the career development that comes uh, through the introduction of new tools and techniques. So Corey is just one of many in our organization who are embracing these tools and, and encouraging others to do the same. You know, in, in the beginning of our conversation, uh, we talked about on the infrastructure front, we were talking about uh, charging stations for electric vehicles. And, and I want to ask, how does a modernizing infrastructure um, plan really affect this supposed new era of electric vehicle use? Yeah, well, first of all, the modern infrastructure is going to be more electric, more connected, and more automated. And we're seeing this in so many different sectors, and transportation being you know, one of the primary examples. I hear a lot of concerns from people that, hey, I'd, I'd buy an electric car, except I'm not sure about whether I'd be able to charge it when I need to charge it. I've got range anxiety. Um, and so what we've recognized is that we're going to need to build out that electric vehicle charging station, much like you might say, hey, there's a gas station on every corner, right? We want to be able to charge our vehicles and know that we can get where we need to be. Now, there are some problems with this because in the early days of electric charging, what we've seen is some private companies stand up and, and build proprietary systems. And that's all well and good. If you're within a region where a particular provider has put in a system and you can go from point to point and, and charge your vehicle, that's great. But what happens when you then want to go to a different region and find that there's a different proprietary system? That's just not going to work for a nation like the U.S. And, and so what we're going to need are open standards for the kinds of equipment that we need to use as part of infrastructure. Charging is, is one of those, but you can imagine there are others where we say, we want this to be a new part of the backbone of our infrastructure. 
When it comes to electric vehicle charging then, we've got to move quickly to roll out chargers. We at Siemens have made the commitment to build another million electric vehicle chargers uh, right here in the United States. And so we have one location in Wendell, North Carolina, where we're manufacturing chargers. We've deployed oh, over 75,000 now, uh, but, but we're actually gonna be working elsewhere in the country and, and expanding that capability as well. We've been a loud voice for open standards. In this digital world, the ability to plug and play, the ability to hook in to multiple systems and, and be able to um, really expand the, the reach it is absolutely vital in our minds. Yeah, I mean, it's about keeping America moving, right? And I think um, the follow-up to that is EVs. Obviously, we're thinking more kind of consumer-focused. But what about businesses in America and how a modern infrastructure will improve their operations, but also supply chains, right? I mean, I think the number one thing being discussed right now on company earnings calls is supply chain snags here in the U.S. They're, they're awful, and people are expecting them to last for at least another year. Yeah. Well, this is why we've been so pleased that the bipartisan infrastructure framework really does have a focus on ports of all kinds. I mean, look at the Port of Los Angeles right now and the real dilemma of how to move adequate goods through that port uh, to support the rest of the ecosystem. So, you know, modern infrastructure, if we um, are successful in getting this more connected and more autonomous infrastructure, we will have the ability to perhaps move things via rail and beginning to hear signals of the introduction of high-speed rail in the U.S., an important step for us. We're seeing uh, signs of uh, greater air infrastructure being expanded out, which gives us more alternatives for the way we move cargo. And then, of course, we're beginning to see signals of more electric fleets for large vehicles, whether it's an electrified highway or whether it is, um, you know, vans and, and uh, you know, large vehicles that are electrified and moving goods for us. All of that is more sustainable. And again, as I say, if we focus on a more regional manufacturing hub, then we take some of the stress off of the long range transportation requirements and really focus in more on the short haul. These are all objectives we share across the industry. You know, Barbara, I, I, I want to get one more question in here with you. And, you know, looking ahead, if it was up to you, the first dollars you spend on new infrastructure updates, where would they go? Hands down, they would go into the grid. Think about it. The grid is the most it, complex machine ever built. <laughs> and everything else we do is built on that backbone of electricity. Our ability to manage the reliable a flow of electricity into all of our industries is vital to our nation. So I'm really a strong proponent for greater grid resilience. And a big part of that comes in in the low and medium voltage part of our grid, the, the, the distribution systems, the introduction of technologies like microgrids and nanogrids. And then this integration from building to transportation systems so that we have a more interconnected grid that can then also manage the supply of renewable energies that are growing all across the nation. Yeah, and I guess uh, that that's really kind of the key here, right, is building out a new grid that can begin to handle uh, the massive amount of energy storage we'll need from those renewable energies now. That's exactly right. 